Namaste, and welcome to another episode of Yoga Vasishta. Today we're going to continue with more of Rama's questions. What can we do under the misty cloud of errors that raise our tempestuous desires, flashing forth in lightning of ambition and bursting out in thunderclaps of selfishness? In other words, when we get desires in this world, they are very passionate. They flash up like lightning. Huh? They spread out like thunder. And they all seem absolutely beyond our control. But what can we do to rid ourselves of the errors that lead to those desires? Because they are certainly due to the mistake of thinking that we can enjoy this world. What is the process to clear those errors? How shall we save ourselves from the temptations of our desires that dance around us like peacocks? So the mind is always concocting these desires. It never stops. And why is that? Because the mind is designed to optimize the condition of this body. It really doesn't have a lot to do with what we want, <laughs> but it's about the body. I want this, I want that. I'm afraid to lose this, I'm afraid to lose the other thing. Oh, what would happen if things changed? And so on. All these desires walking around and around, dancing around like peacocks. How can we ignore them? How can we free ourselves? from them. How shall we save ourselves from the bustle of the world that breaks in on us as thickly as the blossoms of the kurchi plant? Kurchi is a big tree. It grows in India and it's just covered with yellow flowers all year, almost all year round, except in the very cold season in the north. So these desires break in on us. We don't want them. They're disturbance. They agitate us. They make us do things that we really don't want to do. How do we get rid of these desires? How can we fly from the clutches of cruel fate, who, like a cat in the twinkling of an eye, suddenly springs upon his prey and kills the living as if they were poor mice? So now he's again asking how to be free from fate. How can we choose our destiny? And of course, again, the answer is the yoga system. By means of the yoga system, one can choose and attain any destination in the next life according to one's desire, one's will. To what expedient, what course, what reflections, and what refuge must we have recourse in order to avoid the unknown tracks of future lives? This is a good one. Nobody knows where and how we will be reborn. It's a matter of deep psychology. Because to the ordinary mind, to the materialistic mind, one is thrown into life, apparently without asking or wanting it. But actually, to the mind of wisdom, it's clear that we construct our own next life by our thoughts, words, and activities in this life. The value or the quality of those actions and thoughts is what determines how we will be born or the body that we will create in the next life. So this is a very deep truth and one who knows it, who understands it well, can be whatever he wants in the next life or maybe doesn't take a next life at all. 
How can one relish this accursed, troublesome, and vapid world unless he is infatuated by ignorance? In other words, only a fool would love this place. <laughs> only an ignorant idiot would think that this world is nice. And so it is. How is the mist of our desires, which darkens the moon of our intellects, to be dispelled from our minds to make it shine forth in its full brightness? This is a very insightful question. If you have any experience in meditation, you know that when the mind is active, when we are believing in it, thinking that the ego, the body and mind, is the self, we cannot see the inner light. The inner light is blocked, and it's blocked by desires. So how can we free ourselves from these desires so that the natural effulgence of the mind shines out? The answer, of course, is to quiet the mind, still the desires, and erase the ego. How are we to deal with this wilderness of the world, knowing well that it is destructive both of our present and future interests? Again, this goes back to the very early series that we created, Being in the World, which raises this question. If we act for the world, if we care about the world, and we try to please other people and society and so on. It's clearly against our best interest because it's not what we want, it's what others want. So how can we be free of this influence? And of course the answer is to become a real individual, a spiritual being who owes nothing and is not obligated in any way to satisfy the world. Who is there who moves about in this ocean of the earth and who is not buffeted by the waves of his passions and diseases and by the currents of his enjoyments and prosperity? Sometimes life seems pleasant. At other times, it seems difficult. Sometimes everything goes smoothly. And at other times, it's very difficult and frustrating. How are we not to be affected by this? Well, of course, the answer again is to attain self-realization so that our real being, our real life is not in this world, but in the world beyond. How may one who has fallen into the furnace of this earth escape unburned like mercury? How is it possible? If we put mercury in a furnace uh, with other metals like gold and so on, the gold and other metals will melt and be destroyed, at least in their solid form. But mercury, being always liquid, is not destroyed by heat. So how can we remain immune to the hurts of the world? And of course, again, the answer is not to desire anything, not to try to be anyone in this world, but to be who we truly are in the eternity. How can one be rid of the world when it is impossible for him to avoid dealing with it? in the same way as it is impossible for aquatic animals to live without their native element? Well, this is a good one. The answer, of course, is not to regard ourselves as this body, but as pure consciousness. And we always live in the ocean of pure consciousness, which is Brahman, which is everywhere, in all things, at all times. How did the ancient saints flee out of the reach of misery so that I may learn the same to suppress my false conceptions? 
Well, the answer is given along with the question. <laughs> if we suppress our false conceptions, then we are out of the reach of misery because the misery is caused by our wrong ideas, our wrong view. We think that we are this body. We think that this world is real. We think that acting according to our desires will bring us happiness. And all of those are wrong. <laughs> yeah, we may get a little pleasure. We may get a, a certain amount of satisfaction from this world. But actually, our real nature is purely spiritual, pure consciousness. We are actually a citizen of the spiritual world, not this material world, which is more or less a dream. Or is there no such knowledge in existence? Or if there is, is it to be kept secret from me? Well, Rama's getting a little paranoid here. <laughs> you know, it's like Mr. Natural <laughs> saying, yes, there is a secret to life. But I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> you don't deserve to know. But actually, everyone deserves to know. Because we are all part and parcel of the Supreme. We are all children of God. We are all heirs to the heavenly wisdom that enabled the wise men of the past to conquer over all troubles and difficulties of this life and attain peace in the spiritual world. So this should be our aim. And this is how we should read this Yoga Vasishta. I hope you're downloading and reading the materials. Uh, this book one, of course, is just preliminary, but it raises all the main themes as Rama sums up so eloquently with his questions. These questions form the basis for the narrative in the rest of the book. All 1800 pages, <laughs> 24,000 shlokas or verses. So we should understand by reading these questions what the contents or the topics are going to be in the whole rest of the book. Because Vashishta replies very nicely to Rama's questions. And if we pay attention and take his advice to heart, we can experience the solution to all problems and difficulties. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Harihi Aum. Karunar Navamai Kardakadinalgum Arunachalashivam Yidam